You know, yeah, you, you make a sacrifice to the demo gods first thing in the morning, and sometimes they forget by the end of the afternoon. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, but it is time to get, for us to get started here, and I'm sure that no one wants to hang around late. So uh, let's go ahead. Uh, we're here, hopefully, if you, are, if you are here, I assume you're here for messaging techniques in the IoT. Uh, if not, then you're in the wrong room, and you can go ahead and leave now. Uh, I, I, I always appreciate when they say that on the aircraft. It says, if you're not on your way to Denver, then you should probably consider leaving now because this flight is going to Denver. Well, this is what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about messaging techniques in the IoT. Now, uh, when we deal with messaging techniques, if I can get my thing to forward, there we go. Um, just by way of introduction, my name is Mike Anderson. I am chief scientist for the PTR group. Uh, the PTR group does a fair amount of not only robotics uh, for NASA and DARPA and a few others. We also do flight uh, software for various satellite companies. We have about 35 satellites on orbit right now. Uh, we were the first to put Linux in space, as it turns out, back in 2006. So uh, we had a Navy satellite and the Navy was willing to take a chance on running Linux because no one had ever used Linux before. Um, everybody was using VxWorks at that time, so uh, they were willing to uh, take a chance and put Linux on the bird, and the bird's still up there, still working, so we're really happy about that. Uh, myself, I've been in the industry now uh, 40 years this year. I started out as a programmer on an 8080 and Altair back in 1977. So I have seen the industry change quite a bit. And when you take a look at the devices that are available today, Raspberry Pis, BeagleBone Blacks, and things of that sort, you just go, I can't imagine. Uh, you know, in, in, in my day when I first got started, my first embedded system was an IBM 360 Mod 30, uh, which would have taken most of the room here. So uh, today we have quite a bit faster machines, and of course that leads us to this whole issue uh, that we're all here uh, to talk about, and that is the Internet of Things, which is a terrible name. Unfortunately, uh, it is the moniker that's been uh, stuck with us by the uh, individual marketing people. Uh, we'll talk about connectivity in that. We'll deal with some of the messaging models that are being used in the IoT, and then we'll talk about the different implementations of different messaging techniques. Uh, we will also compare those in terms of efficiency for the individual uh, techniques that are going to be using for wireless and connectivity so that you'll have a pretty good idea of, okay, if I do this, it's going to cost me that when I get ready to actually put this across the uh, wireless interface. And then we'll hit a quick summary there. So in the world of the IoT, of course, depending on who you believe, uh, we could have anywhere from 20 billion to 80 billion devices attached to the internet by the year 2020. Well, that's only three years away. Um, the reality is that if you think about the amount of power that uh, 70 billion devices would require, uh, it far outstrips the entire power production capability of the world. So somehow I suspect we're going to run into a limit long before we get to those kinds of numbers. But uh, nonetheless, suffice to say there's going to be a lot of devices attached to the Internet. Uh, we have to deal with several different things. When we're trying to design a system for use in the IoT, we have to understand a, what the system's supposed to do, obviously, um, what our say, size, weight, and power requirements are, and more importantly these days, how we're going to connect it. If we are dealing with the Internet of Things, we're really talking about things that are connected to the Internet, or at least connected to each other. So how do we handle that connectivity, given that we're not going to be running, uh, say, fiber optic lines or Ethernet cables, across an open field out in the middle of the San Joaquin Valley someplace. So uh, when we're dealing with a lot of the individual applications for the IoT, we're really, in some cases, they're uh, solutions looking for problems. But nonetheless, we have to come with some, as a designer, it's our responsibility to come up with an approach that allows us to be able to actually make that concept a reality. Uh, we'll talk about several different topics in this particular presentation. We'll deal with the communications media itself, addressability, the individual protocols that are used, a little bit of security, and of course a couple of other things as we go along the path. 
So in terms of IoT connectivity models, we need to really consider one of a couple of different approaches. Uh, the first one is what's referred to generally as the cloud model. In the cloud model, devices are directly connected to the internet. That is, my little temperature sensor out in the middle of a field somewhere is actually connected to the internet and is going to be uploading its raw data to a cloud server someplace that is supposed to be doing something with that data. Now, that particular model, uh, on the plus side, the data grubbers, the data analysts people, uh, want to get all that raw data because they are concerned that somewhere squirreled away in that raw data is that nugget that they've been looking for that's going to change the entire market. Whether you believe that or not is a different issue. Um, they certainly believe it, and therefore they put a requirement on those of us who are designing systems to actually try to get them the raw data. Now, the reality is by having our device directly connected to the internet, we are exposing ourselves to all of the black hats that are out there and people who have nothing else better to do with their time than to try and hack into your system and cause you trouble. So that's probably not the general model that we would want to consider. There is an alternative approach, and that alternative approach is known as the fog model. In the fog model, the individual sensors and the devices that are out doing their work in the network um, are actually never directly attached to the internet. They are attached to a border gateway or a border router. And the border router is responsible for taking all of the data, doing some collation of it, throwing out bad samples, and then sending the cooked data up to the cloud so that the data grubbers then get the cooked data, not the raw data. Now, what this does is this removes the possibility that there's going to be some hidden piece, of, some hidden gem in the raw data. They're not going to see the raw data, and therefore they may not be able to find the hidden gem. Um, but on the other hand, from a security perspective, it also limits your attack surface. Because now I can focus on making sure that I've got, say, a Linux device or some other type of device that is protected, hardened, hardened kernel, remove all the individual um, you know, non-essential services. Uh, maybe I'm going to run it in a container. Who knows? But I want to try and eliminate as much of the attack surface as I can and make sure that the devices that are behind the border gateway are never exposed to anybody from the outside. That's the general idea. And there are some ways of doing that that guarantees that no one is going to be able to talk to those things directly from the outside. Um, if I'm using wonky protocols on the inside of my little network here uh, that don't route. If they don't route, it's awful tough for me to be able to get access to them from the outside world. Not impossible. Nothing is impossible. Given enough time and money, anything is possible. But uh, in terms of just trying to eliminate as much of the attack surface as possible, the FOG model is one that a lot of the individual corporations that are focusing on the IoT are really trying to hone in on because it's the one that proposes, at least exposes the least amount of attack surface to the outside world. Now, uh, let's see here. Oh, I went the wrong way, I guess. There we go. Of course, in order for us to be able to do anything with the Internet of Things, we have to think about how we're going to be connecting these devices. And there are lots of communications techniques that are out there, of course. We have uh, you know, anything from Ethernet. Uh, of course, we have RS-422, RS-485. Those are pretty old techniques. But it's remarkable that a lot of the industrial world, especially water purification plants, uh, power production plants, things along those lines, are still uh, using devices that are 20 milliamp current loop, RS-485, RS-422, RS-423, old standards that uh, many of us here in the room probably have never had to deal with, uh, mercifully on your part, uh, those of us who have to deal with things like RS-485 and RS-422, uh, they become the bane of our existence. Uh, just simply because of the, the, na the nasty cabling and everything that goes along with it. Um, on the other hand, what we're really seeing and what we're trying to see in terms of a focus for a lot of the IoT is wireless connectivity. And whether that's traditional Wi-Fi, whether that's 802.15.4, 
uh, whether that's uh, some of the new modes of LTE cellular. Uh, we'll talk about those as we go along here. Um, but definitely the emphasis for the IoT is wireless connectivity. Now understand that in the wireless world, if we were to take a look at the entire wireless spectrum from DC to daylight, there's not that much that's available to us in terms of available frequencies. Uh, we do have the ISM bands, the uh, industrial and scientific uh, medical machine bands. Uh, of course, the 2.4 gigahertz band is the one that's kind of universal across the entire globe at this point. Uh, but there are many, many others here in the United States. We have the 5 gigahertz band. There's a 1.2 gigahertz band. Um, and where we see a lot of the IoT starting to focus is sub gigahertz. Now, when we say sub gigahertz, here in the United States, that's the 915 megahertz band. In Europe, that's uh, like 868 megahertz or something along those lines. Uh, 800 something megahertz. Uh, in China, 700 something megahertz. There's also a 432 megahertz band. So it just depends on what part of the world you're in uh, as to exactly why you would be focusing on particular frequency ranges. The advantage of sub gigahertz is its distance. When we take a look at 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz, especially 5 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz has a real problem about penetrating walls. And if I have rebar in uh, the building walls, that becomes a major problem for uh, 5 gigahertz. 2.4 gigahertz, it kind of goes all right, but you'll notice that in most of these rooms, there's a little uh, repeater that tries to get the Wi-Fi down here because Wi-Fi by itself would not normally go through all these walls. So when we start switching to the sub gigahertz bands, then we start talking about uh, being able to do a kilometer or more in terms of the, re in terms of the range for this particular type of uh, frequency bands. So most of us are familiar with the standard 80211 flavors, A, B, G, N, A, C, et cetera. Uh, but there's a new one coming out, and this new one is called Wi-Fi Halo, otherwise known as 80211AH. Wi-Fi Halo is sub gigahertz. Uh, it runs in the 900 megahertz band here in the United States. Uh, it is low power Wi-Fi, and its sole purpose is for you to be able to connect up to thousands of devices to a single access point and have those thousands of devices be able to communicate with the access point, which will then translate it from Wi-Fi Halo into normal Wi-Fi or into Ethernet or some other technology. Uh, the thing about Wi-Fi Halo, it's IP-based communications uh, in the 20 to 40 megabit per second range. So not horribly fast, we're not talking 100 megabit or gigabit kinds of speeds, but certainly fast enough that you can actually get a lot of data through at 20 megabits per second. Uh, the special access points, of course, then have to be set up to deal with this. There's also a, a variant of this that does mesh topology. So you can actually have a Wi-Fi mesh uh, 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 network set up. So Wi-Fi Halo, definitely something that is coming on at this point. Um, they have, uh, now they've got an official logo, so that of course is always a positive sign when they actually go to the trouble of doing the artwork for an official logo. And uh, we'll start seeing these sometime this year. Uh, it's not too far off, but because they are running sub gigahertz, uh, without having to do anything particularly magic in terms of antennas, uh, we should be able to get a kilometer out of the uh, individual, in, uh, individual components. There's another one out there called LoRa. It was originally called LoRa, now called LoRa WAN. And LoRa is a sub gigahertz, but it's a star of stars. So rather than being a wireless mesh or a loosely coupled mesh, uh, this is a star of stars topology. It uses a ES128 for its encryption and runs in the various bands, the EU868, uh, uh, the 433 megahertz bands, and so forth. Uh, it's based on a proprietary radio technology from a company called Simtech. Uh, according to the documentation from Simtech, this is supposed to be a symmetric connection, uh, something less than 100 kilobits per second. Uh, the reality is that most of the links I've seen for LoRaWAN are actually running at 38.4 kilobits per second. 
So 38.4K range is about two clicks, uh, about two kilometers in urban settings, about 22 kilometers in rural settings. Uh, it is not IP based, however. So it depends on concentrators that are then going to take the transmission on LoRaWAN and convert it into IP so you can then send it up to the cloud. Uh, the radios that they have, uh, most of this stuff is available from multiple manufacturers except for the concentrators. Once you start getting to the concentrators, then the folks at Simtech still control that. They haven't licensed that silicon to anybody else. So you pretty much are at their individual mercy uh, in terms of being able to get any additional information out of them. So that's a, but that's certainly one. Uh, it has seen a lot of deployment, especially in Africa. Uh, we're starting to see it deployed much more widely here in the United States and of course in Asia as well. Uh, Europe uh, has had LoRaWAN for a while. And we're uh, expecting to see that probably expand in a certain, uh, in a certain extent. But uh, it really is very much proprietary. And because it doesn't use IP as its transport mechanism, it means that you're going to have to have some other messaging technology to get the data across. Again, it's supposed to be symmetric. We've seen some cases where it's not quite so symmetric. Uh, as a matter of fact, very asymmetric in terms of the upload speeds versus download speeds. But that's usually a factor of the radio itself. Uh, when we start getting into a situation where we're not getting very good bit error rates, they start narrowing the band down uh, to try and uh, do a little bit better in terms of the, um, the signal to noise ratio so they can actually get the signal through. There's another one out there called Sigfox. Uh, Sigfox is a proprietary cellular-like communication service, also in the sub-gigahertz bands. Uh, this targets really thro low-throughput devices, typically remote sensor-type devices. Up to 140 messages a day from these devices, and the payload is only 12 bytes. So you're definitely not going to be running IP across something like this. But, uh, and the throughput is a whopping 100 bits per second. Uh, but for very low power type of use, Sigfox is a definitely, uh, definitely a viable option. Range is about 10 clicks in urban settings, about 50 clicks in rural applications. So uh, it really focuses on very low power consumption for sensors that just want to wake up, squirt a number like a temperature or something, a humidity, something along those lines, uh, up through the network and then shut back down again. Again, like we had with uh, LoRaWAN, we have a gateway requirement. We have to have a gateway in order to convert it from whatever the internal Sigfox format is into something that can be routed across the internet. Then uh, we, have, we have the kind of venerable 802.15.4. 802.15.4 uh, has been around for a while. And uh, it is typically going to be found in the 2.4 gigahertz band. But there is quite a few examples of 802.15.4. Uh, there are several examples that are running in the sub-gigahertz bands. And these are typically going to be different manufacturers' technologies that sit on top of 802.15.4. 802.15.4 defines like six or seven different Macs uh, in different frequency ranges. So they actually support the Chinese medical band and several others. But 802.15.4 actually only defines up through layer two. Then layer three through layer seven are up to individual manufacturers to set on top of that. 802.15.4 is a wireless mesh topology. It is self-healing. If something, if a node goes down, then it'll simply find another way around that failed node and keep communicating. Uh, those of us here in the United States uh, we actually see this network in, in very broad deployment in advanced metering infrastructure. So AMI applications, uh, ITRON and um, Cisco uh, have teamed together to create meters that now have the ability to uh, use the 802.15.4 in the 900 megahertz band and set up a wireless mesh so they can then report information up to the individual uh, monopoly, the uh, utility, uh, 
The interesting thing about this particular approach in the way it's being used in advanced metering infrastructure is that they don't tell you that it's actually a bi-directional communications. So the, the folks who are reading your meters, they used to drive around in a truck and read the meter off of a 900 megahertz radio. Uh, they don't have to do that anymore. Now it reports to a cellular link, which is a little gray box typically on side of a, on a, a light pole someplace. And that cellular link will then report back to the utility. Interesting thing is the utility can now, if you don't pay your bill, they used to have to send a truck out to shut your power off. They don't have to do that anymore. Now they can just send a signal from the main service facility and shut your power off automatically. Uh, which raises some interesting questions about security, but we'll deal, we will deal with that a little bit later. Uh, in terms of the, the typical protocols we see on top of 802.15.4, uh, of course, Zigbee is probably the one that's the most widely known. Uh, there's also Z-Wave. The Thread Alliance has their thread uh, system that sits on top of that. Uh, the Thread Alliance actually only defines up through layer four, and then it's up to individual manufacturers to put their layer five through layer seven on top of that. Uh, one of the interesting things is, uh, of course, Zigbee IP, which came out about three years ago, uh, didn't really catch on uh, because it was too confusing for the people who were in the me as members of the Zigbee Alliance. Uh, what are we using? Are we using IP or are we using Zigbee? But uh, they've cut a deal. Uh, the Zigbee Alliance has cut a deal with the Threat Alliance. Of course, the Threat Alliance are the people who are Google Nest and Big Ass Fans and a whole bunch of other companies. There's about 230 or so of them that are members of the Threat Alliance. Um, they have cut a deal so that they're going to have the Zigbee libraries available on top of Thread. So if you can't beat them, join them, cut a deal, and lo and, hold, lo and behold, we will now see Zigbee layer four, actually layer five through seven, sitting on top of thread, which sets on top of 802.15.4. So the layering of protocols gets to be a little uh, wonky at times, but um, the advantage of 802.15.4 is Linux already supports it. Uh, we see lots of implementations of it that can be done in relatively lightweight radios, and you can get decent performance out of it, typically uh, two clicks with a halfway decent antenna uh, without having to do a whole lot of extra stuff and it is particularly targeted at low power operation. As far as the individual uh, Internet of Things devices are concerned, uh, 802.15.4 looks like a UART. So it's very simple. You don't really have to have any particular implementation of the protocol. The radios typically implement the protocol, and the radios also implement AES-128 encryption. So it does have link encryption. If you want to go beyond that, and you want to go to end-to-end -to -end encryption, then typically they'll be using DTLS, uh, the datagram uh, transport layer security. Uh, there is, of course, one of the big issues that has come about because of where our good friends, the telcos, are these days. Um, here in the United States, we have reached 104% saturation on smartphone usage. Uh, that is over 100% of everyone who would ever buy a smartphone has one. And we say more than 100% because many people have more than one device. They have tablets, they have extra phones, et cetera. So they, at this point, it means that the only way for the carriers, the telcos, to actually be able to gain more revenue share, more market share, is by stealing customers from somebody else. And we see this all the time, the advertisements. Come to T-Mobile, we are, you know, we're 100% uh, unlimited data. Oh, screw those T-Mobile guys, come to Verizon, we have the best signal ever. And now uh, everybody, now Sprint is saying they're within 1%, whatever. Uh, the issue is the only way for them to increase market share is to steal market from somebody else. Except when it now comes to the Internet of Things. And this has got the telcos really excited because they see this as a whole new market of potentially billions of devices that are now going to start using their cellular system. So in order to support that, the cellular communications folks uh, have come up with LTE Evolution. And with LTE Evolution, we actually see three new flavors that are targeting low power, wide area networks. And that is LTE Cat 1, CAT M.1, excuse me, dot 
cat.m1 and cat.nb1. Um, cat1 is, uh, you know, of course, one of the major issues with the telcos, they have been focusing on faster and faster and faster networks. They want to be able to deliver 60 megabits per second to your phone. But you don't need 60 megabits per second in a device that's only going to send out a temperature and a humidity once every half hour. That's major overkill. And of course, that radio, because it is such a fast radio, is very expensive from a power consumption perspective. So they've targeted these new variants of LTE. Uh, one of them, the CAT.1, is less than 10 megabits per second on the download, less than 5 megabits per second on the upload. So most of these are going to be asymmetric. That's fine because in most cases, we really want to be able to download, for instance, an update, but we really don't care to have the same kind of bandwidth coming back up from the sensor because the sensor doesn't have that much data to ever report in the first place. Uh, CAT M1 is one megabit per second, and that's a symmetric one. That's upload and download at one megabit per second. Uh, we then see CAT NB1, which is narrow band one, and that's 170 kilobits per second on the download, uh, 250 kilobits per second on the upload side. These all work like normal cellular. So you can run IP across them, IPv4, IPv6, doesn't matter. Uh, they behave like cellular, they use the cellular infrastructure. It's just a new mode for the radios. So if you have cellular coverage, then you should be able to see these new standards become available for you in the not too distant future. Uh, but they, the key thing here is that these will be billed as data usage. So it does count against your data and they are counting every single byte you transfer and they are billing you for that. Which comes into play when we start talking about which messaging techniques we should be using in the IoT. Of course, the old standards, ones like Bluetooth, they've been around for a while. Uh, we see Bluetooth Classic and Bluetooth Smart. Uh, when is Bluetooth not Bluetooth? It's when it's Bluetooth Low Energy. Uh, BLE or Bluetooth Smart is a completely different standard. It just happens to have Bluetooth as its logo. Um, it uses a different radio modulation technique. It does happen to sit in the same 2.4 gigahertz band, but Bluetooth Low Energy and Bluetooth Classic are really not very well related to each other at all. They're completely separate libraries, everything else. So um, either one of these, however, could be running IP or they could run PPP, for instance. Uh, but Classic is typically better targeted at this kind of thing because Classic is more connection oriented. Whereas Bluetooth, Bluetooth Low Energy is like I happen to be walking through the room and there's something that tells me what the temperature is. It's going to say what the temperature is whether I asked it to or not. I just happen to be close enough by that I could receive the, what the temperature is. So Bluetooth low energy targeted much more at sensors. The problem with Bluetooth, if you have a class one Bluetooth device, it can actually do 100 meters. I have yet to encounter more than a half dozen or so Bluetooth class one, category one devices. Uh, most of them are cat three, which means we see about 30 meters out of them, if we're lucky. Um, for those of you who actually use Bluetooth headsets, you realize that the range on Bluetooth is actually about three feet. Um, not, not by design, but just <laughs> that's, according to the spec, it's supposed to be much better than that. Yeah. But uh, unfortunately, the spec and reality often differ. <laughs> that's right. Uh, so uh, the question is, do we want IP or not? And that's an interesting question in and of itself. Because if we want to be able to say we have a cloud model, the cloud model only works if our devices speak IP, all the way from our device up to the cloud where we're going to be recording all this data. If we're using the fog model, then that limitation disappears. Because we can speak anything we want to on the local network segment. The only thing that has to speak actual IP is the border gateway. So if I'm going to be running in the fog model, then the restriction of having to have IP implemented on my device pretty much goes away. But there are a lot of wireless standards that don't support IP. As we saw, Sigfox, for instance, at uh, a whopping 12 bytes worth of payload is not going to support IP very well. So when we start deciding whether we're going to do IP or not, 
that then drives the decision for which one of those messaging, which one of those communications techniques we use, and of course will also drive the decision on the actual messaging model that we use. Now, the messaging patterns themselves break out into three basic categories. We see something called publish subscribe, also known as pub sub. Publish subscribe, basically the sensors are going to publish their data to a broker and the broker will then have the data in its hands, and if someone who has subscribed to the data will be informed that there's new data available, or they can actually go and either, it can either be push data or it can be pull data, depending on how we want to set that model up. Um, the one that is probably the best example of PubSub is MQTT. We'll talk about MQT in some detail in just a moment. Another one of the models is client server. Uh, with client server, that's kind of our traditional web service kind of thing. I've got a web server sitting out there. My data gets, pub gets sent by the client. It connects to the server, transfers the data, and then disconnects. Uh, we see a couple of different implementations of that, RESTful protocols and a protocol called CoAP. Uh, we'll talk about all of these coming up. Uh, and then the last one is peer-to-peer. -peer. The peer-to-peer -peer is now I have a point-to-point -point connection. Uh, client server is a modification of that, but I might actually have peer-to-peer -peer do relays for me, uh, which is going to be a slightly different model than what we would see typically with traditional client server. So these messaging patterns are then represented in various types of messaging protocols. Uh, the first one we'll take a look, la look at here is message queue telemetry transport, otherwise known as MQTT. That was originally developed by IBM back in 1999 long before the Internet of Things was even somebody's um, you know, imagination. Uh, it is now an ISO standard and has also been standardized by the OASIS folks, uh, which is another standards organization for uh, uh, information interchange. It's designed as a lightweight messaging protocol. And the interesting thing about the way MQTT works, there's really no specific format being placed on the actual payload. Uh, there's an MQTT header, and we have the publish subscribe. There has to be a broker someplace that's going to be the central repository. There may be more than one broker available to us, but it is a pub-sub messaging model. And there, uh, because there's no particular format on the payload, it means that we have to kind of figure out ahead of time, I'm going to send this data. It's going to be a floating point followed by two decimals followed by a string. Everybody has to know that that's going to be the format of the data before you send it. Otherwise, the people who are subscribing to that data are not going to be able to figure out what the data is. Uh, the broker has to interpret that, puts it into its individual data stores, and then the subscribers come along later and grab that information out of the data store. MQTT has uh, five basic methods. We have a connect, a disconnect, subscribe, and unsubscribe, and then a publish method. Uh, this one happens to be used by a couple of relatively large vendors. Uh, of course, IBM's Bluemix and the Amazon IoT platform also use MQTT. But one of the distinct advantages of MQTT is that most of the IoT frameworks that are out there today all understand MQTT. Uh, whether it's IoTivity, All Scene Alliance, uh, you've got, uh, of course, the folks at ThingWorks, all these individual major suppliers of, or wannabe suppliers of individual IoT solutions, uh, all support MQTT. It's kind of the one universal that we have. Uh, of course, there are some open source implementations of both the MQTT protocol itself as well as the message brokers. Probably the one that's most well known is the Eclipse Mosquito, but it also turns out that OpenStack and MyQTT also do it. Uh, OpenStack actually does it as kind of a side effect of what OpenStack is supposed to do in terms of virtualization and cloud uh, service providers. Uh, they just happen to use MQTT as some of the protocols that are being used to exchange information on OpenStack. Uh, another one of the messaging protocols is DDS. That's the Data Distribution Service. Uh, this originally started as a military protocol used in distributed simulations. This is back in the 1990s. And uh, it turned out that it had a lot of applicability to many, many different applications. Um, it's used, for instance, in Aegis missile cruisers. It's used a lot by the military. Uh, but they've kind of now broken out of that mold and said, look, what we really 
Uh, we're just a messaging. We're just middleware. It doesn't matter if it's a military or a commercial application. Um, let's go ahead and kind of break this out as a separate protocol and kind of distinguish ourselves from the government applications. It is a pub-sub protocol, but unlike what we see with MQTT, there's no broker. In this particular case for, MD, uh, for DDS, DDS actually does point-to-point uh, it is using multicast. So it uses a multicast protocol. There's two different levels of interfaces here. We have the data-centric publish subscribe, which is focused on the delivery. And with DDS, you can say that this is just a broadcast of data. You can say that it requires an acknowledgment. You can say that it requires a security tag. So there's different levels of security and different levels of communications with hashes and things of that sort that you can set on every type of data in DDS. There's also a version of DDS or a layer that sits on top of DDS called lightweight CORBA component model. And for those of you who are in the data business, uh, you're probably familiar with CORBA. Uh, this is, uh, they, they do have an implementation of it for DDS. It also supports uh, unified modeling language, UML profiles, and a lot of platform-specific modeling. So there's a lot of data modeling tools that are available for DDS. Um, in terms of where we see DDS right now, most of the DDS stuff is happening in the commercial world where companies like Real-Time Innovations, RTI, and several others are competing with each other to sell DDS stacks. There is an open DDS that has been implemented, so there is an open source version of this. Um, how, uh, but the open DDS, is, as I understand it, and I could be wrong, uh, is playing catch up right now with the commercial implementations. So the commercial implementations have been out there for 20 years, 20 plus years now. Uh, the open DDS version is just now coming kind of into its own. We have uh, another one, XMPP. This is the Extensible Messaging Presence Protocol. This is actually used by Jabber and Facebook. Um, this one, all the messages are in XML, and it can be sent using uh, TCP and HTTP transports. So with XMPP, it's a client server. You can actually use it client server. You can use it pub sub, or you can use peer to peer with XMPP. There are multiple open source implementations of this. Uh, and, of course, because it's being used by Facebook, there are a lot of people who are familiar with it, and they've already created applications that take advantage of XMPP. Kind of moving along that line, we see REST, which is represent representational state transfer. Uh, this is basically a protocol that just simply uses HTTP verbs. So get, post, put, delete, etc. Everything looks like a web service. I mean, this is one of those classic, if I'm an IT guy and I understand how web servers work, then I'm going to design an IoT protocol that work like web servers. That's what they've done. And uh, the implementation, any implementation, any protocol, a transport mechanism that uses HTTP could be thought of as RESTful, uh, RESTful protocol. So because it uses standard web service, web type uh, transfer verbs, uh, basically there are lots of open source implementations of RESTful type protocols. Now, if we were to take the RESTful protocol, the HTTP get and put verbs, and remove all the XML and JSON and all the rest of the stuff and just condense it down to binary, that's where we have COAP. COAP is a constrained application protocol uh, it's essentially a binary version of REST. The advantage is that this has been specifically tuned for use in low resource type devices. So very small memory footprints, very low data rates. Um, it, is, it sits on top of UDP. It takes advantage of data trans, uh, datagram transfer, uh, excuse me, datagram transport layer security, so DTLS. It's compatible with six low pan compatible with IPv4 as well. Uh, it does have support for resource discovery, so it can actually send out uh, what effectively looks like a multicast message that says, hey, where's the border router? And there may be more than one of them that answer, and then it just simply says, oh, well, you're closer. I'll start sending my data to you. So COAP is a, definitely an interesting protocol. It uh, can be used typically either in client server or peer-to-peer -peer modes, but the advantage is of that binary transfer. It's not using HTML or XML or JSON to do all of its transfers. And that, of course, 
is a major win when we start talking about where the carriers are right now. Of course, there are some other messaging protocols, some of the proprietary ones like Zigbee, Z-Wave, and Wireless Heart. Uh, these are all proprietary. There is no open source implementation of these. Uh, whereas with CoAP, you have an open source implementation. There are several of the others that have open source implementations. But um, for instance, with Zigbee, if you're not a member of the Zigbee Alliance, then sorry for you, you can't uh, do anything, you can't design anything that uses Zigbee. You can be a consumer of Zigbee, you can be a consumer of Wireless Heart, but if you're going to be producing products that use those standards, you have to be a member of their respective alliances in order to be able to uh, get access to the standards and the radios that go along with them. Of course, the lack of IP here is going to limit our options. If we're using something like Zigbee or Wireless Heart or Z-Wave, they don't speak IP, which means I'm not going to be able to use an 802.15.4 uh, six low pan type of transport mechanism, nor am I going to be able to use standard IP. So the uh, cases of being able to use Halo, Wi-Fi Halo, uh, that uses IP. So if you're using Zigbee, you're not going to be using Halo as your transport mechanism. So this also is going to limit your ability to debug the connection. Because if you don't have the ability to start up Wireshark and watch the packets go back and forth, how are you going to debug the protocol? You have to buy proprietary tools to debug the protocol, which of course can get rather expensive after a while. Transmission issues, of course, cellular carriers love REST and XMPP because they use XML, JSON, and HTTP-oriented messages, which means lots of more bytes get transferred. And since they bill you by the byte, they really want you to use these other protocols that spend a lot of time being very verbose with lots of XML formatting. They love that. Uh, of course, if you really want to think in terms of HTTP verbs, then co-op is your answer. It works like HTTP, it just doesn't use ASCII to send the data back and forth. It uses binary encoded stuff. Now, cybersecurity, of course, you, you can't do anything these days without having to worry about cybersecurity. Uh, lots of bad actors out there. Of course, we saw last October uh, a significant denial of service attack against the East Coast of the United States, uh, against the DNS servers, which pretty much shut down the East Coast. At a minimum, when we're dealing with any of these radio standards, we have to make sure that our links are encrypted. If our links are not encrypted, then anybody with a receiver can pick them up and start decoding them. Uh, that might give them some information, for instance, what person are you in network, what PAN ID you happen to be, or uh, what kind of uh, other characteristics you have. This, this guy is a, a temperature sensor, but this guy controls the motors that actually run the uh, individual mining equipment. So those are the kinds of things that we need to try and protect. So at a minimum, we're going to want to encrypt the links. But the reality is that simply encrypting the links is usually not enough. We need to think in terms of end-to-end -end encryption. And end-to-end -end encryption means from application to application. And when we start talking about application to application encryption, now we're talking about either TLS, if we're using TCP, or DTLS, if we're using UDP as our transport mechanisms. Of course, code signing, certificates, uh, all that sort of business, we have to take that into account. And I'm sure you're probably uh, tired of hearing about that kind of stuff after several days of IoT here at this conference. Um, but the bottom line is that the FOG model makes it a lot easier to secure because I don't need to worry about each individual sensor being able to get all the way to the internet and get its acknowledgments back. So which messaging API should you use? Well, of course, it depends. Uh, if you're looking for the broadest support, you, wanna have, you don't want to tie yourself down to a particular radio technology or a particular transport mechanism, then the best one available to you is probably MQTT. It's the most flexible. It's the one that's most widely supported by the most different vendors out there. So if you go with MQTT, you're probably not going to go wrong if the transport mechanism is, in fact, IP. If it's not IP, then MQTT can still be used. We just have to make sure that we understand the mechanisms for doing publish and subscribe when we have a, a communications model that's asymmetric uh, 
and doesn't necessarily support publish subscribe kinds of models. If on the other hand you want a web-like model, then I would not use REST unless I was talking from the border gateway to the cloud server. That, you're connected to the internet, knock yourself out. Use whatever technique you want. But if I'm going to be going from a low performance device such as a Cortex-M0+, Cortex-M3 or M4, out in the field, I don't want to put too much uh, burden on it. I'm going to allow the radio to do the IP. I'm going to allow the radio to do the communications and the encryption. I want to do as little, as little as possible inside of the actual device itself. So in that case, CoAP probably is a better model for you, if you like the idea of uh, HTTP get and put kind of things. Of course, there are a lot of wireless options. Most of them support IP, so we do have a lot of flexibility there. Uh, MQTT, CoAP, both of those work reasonably well on uh, resource-constrained devices. Now, the Internet of Things, and of course its brethren, the industrial Internet of Things, which you'll start seeing that one pop up more and more over the next uh, couple of years, uh, there has no shortage of offerings. Uh, whether we're dealing with standard radio communications traffic, uh, unfortunately our big issue with uh, wireless communications is a limitation in the amount of available bandwidth. If you're not running in one of the ISM bands, you gotta have a license. There was a recent licensing that happened with the FCC, and I think they paid $18 billion for a frequency band. Um, you know, trying to get your own personal license for a section of the frequency spectrum, not an easy or cheap thing to do. So this really pushes a lot of manufacturers and builders into one of the ISM bands, 900 megahertz, 868, uh, you know, 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz bands. Of course, uh, wireless standards like Bluetooth Low Energy, Wi-Fi, 802.15.4, uh, they help deal with the physical connectivity. They are, in many cases, very resilient, especially 802.15.4, or Wi-Fi Halo, another one that is, looks to be very resilient. We don't have enough information about it at this point. We haven't seen enough of it to be able to tell. But uh, they should be able to provide us that kind of universal connectivity that we're looking for. Uh, especially if our focus is trying to do things with um, IP or IP-related services like 6LOPAN. Uh, you have to consider the attack surface. You have to consider whether or not open source availability is an important thing to you. I mean, you're here at the Linux conference. We assume, uh, I assume at least, that uh, you're here because you think open source is a valuable product and a valuable tool. So uh, going with a completely proprietary solution for your IoT communications may not necessarily be the right thing to do. Um, certainly that's my personal opinion, but uh, you know, it's worth what you paid for it, I guess. So consider your attack surfaces when you're getting ready to do your message decisions. Um, I have just a couple minutes here, and what I want to do is I want to show you an actual IoT thing using MQTT. Uh, and for those of you who uh, don't really care one way or the other, uh, let's see if I can bring it up here. Uh, that would be this guy here, and oh, that's right. I need to uh, need to do one more thing. I need to communicate with ADB in order to kick off the VNC server that I'm using to communicate, because the whole thing is set up to uh, to talk over my cell phone here. And of course it says, uh, send to, try again. So let me try and do my ADB devices. Ah, there it sees it. And now I'm going to launch the VNC server. That should be there. And it says my server has stopped, of course. You know, it's a question of, uh, oh, there we go. Now it says the server's running. That's a hopeful thing. Uh, let me go ahead and try and launch this now. Oh, how about that? Ah, okay. So, uh, for whatever reason, it's now decided to run in some horribly off-sized mode. But uh, that's okay. We'll do the best we can with that. And let's go ahead and launch the tool. And, ooh, it would also help if I turned on the device, wouldn't it? 
Um, this is a TI sensor tag. So this is a CC2650, uh, I think. And uh, what it does is it identifies itself as a, a sensor tag in this little uh, sampling thing here. And I, whoops, helps if I don't do that. Now does it? Simple link starter, come on. Bluetooth, scan, there we go, sensor tag, yay. So now it's uh, discovering services, and of course you can't see that. As soon as it finishes there, we should be able to then scroll up. <coughs> and let me see if I can get that to scroll here. But we see the, amp the ambient temperature data. Come on. There we go. Ah. All right, so now. So it has accelerometers, it has magnetometers, it has uh, little switches you can push the buttons, and these, I think these are like 20 bucks. Um, but it uses Bluetooth low energy, and it uses MQTT to talk from this device to the cell phone. And there's actually even a mechanism uh, if you were to uh, scroll back up here, there is a mechanism to uh, push it to the cloud. So it understands uh, Bluemix. So it does IBM Bluemix, and you'll be able to actually use MQTT, push it up to the cloud, and then pull the data out with Node.js and Node.red, and then you can create your own little dashboard. Uh, it's a great little way, uh, and this is actually uh, originally targeted for use on uh, BeagleBone Black and a Raspberry Pi. So it communicates from this to the Raspberry Pi or the BeagleBone Black, and then that links it up to Bluemix. And then you can get a free 30-day trial of Bluemix, play around with the dashboards, play around with Node.js, Node.red, and be able to pull the data off of it and say, ooh, this is really cool. What can I do with this? So if you're interested in doing a little bit of experimentation, uh, for 20 bucks and a Raspberry Pi, uh, you have the ability to start pushing data up to the cloud. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, you know, so absolutely, this one just happens to be the 2650, uh, the 3310s, uh, the 3320s, the 3200 series. Uh, Texas Instruments has a lot of different parts that work in different frequency bands uh, and do different things. I happen to like this one because it's, like I say, it's 20 bucks, and you can do Bluetooth, you can do uh, six low pan, and you can do Zigbee off the same little unit. You just have to load a different firmware to it. But absolutely, there's lots of opportunities out there, lots of alternatives. But it kind of gives you a way of being able to kind of get your foot wet with a techno technology like MQTT, Node-RED, being able to get the data up to the cloud, read it, bring it back, see exactly what that's like before you make your decisions about how much you're going to commit on a radio or a messaging technology. Any other questions? Mercifully, no? Okay, in that case, thank you very much.